Recording in progress. Okay, today's stuff we're going to be learning is Yoma Samach Aleph. Chodesh Tov to everyone. Um, before we start, I just want to mention that the Siyum is already planned. The date went out on Facebook. Um, we, we're going to have two different types of Siyums this time. In Israel, we're going to have Siyums in different locations. So for those of you in Israel, you can join a Siyum in different locations around the country to be published soon. And in England, then most of those will be in Hebrew. I assume maybe maybe one or two will end up in English, but probably mostly in Hebrew. And in English, we'll be doing our regular Zoom for everybody abroad and in Israel. And that will be, so the Siyumim around the country will be on the 8th and the 9th. We actually finish Yoma on the 8th, so it'll be the 8th and the 9th, Thursday, Thursday night, Friday. And the ones, the Zoom one is going to be on Sunday. To keep it on Sunday is it's easier for people abroad to make it to a seam on Sunday. Hopefully, I'm sure not for everyone it's easier, but for some people, for most people. So it'll be on Sunday, the July 11th. Um, so we hope you'll all join us for some part of it, whatever works for you. You can join both parts if you live in Israel or you're visiting. You know, some people are visiting them, which would be nice to see people. Um, you'll all be invited to any seam that works for you in any location. Okay, we're going to start now. Yoma Daf Samach Aleph. Um, we'll start with our dedications. We have some for the month. The month of Tammuz is sponsored by Rabbi Freda Cohen and Eric Nussbaum in memory of Freda's beloved father, Mitchell Cohen, Michael Ben Shraga Feivel Halevi, whose 27th year at site falls on the 16th of Tammuz. He was so kind, sweet, and funny. He had a big open heart for Kal Yisrael, the Chol Yoshvei Tevel. He would never have categorized himself as a Talmud or a Torah, a Torah or a Talmud scholar, but indeed he was. The father of three girls, he gave all of us a Jewish education, a loving husband who endured our mom. There was no one I missed more on the day I received smicha as he was my inspiration and my, my, my ballast. He would be delighted to know that he has nine grandchildren, two of whom carry his name and two great-grandchildren. He was truly an Ishna Eman. The month is also dedicated for a Fua Shlema of Pesha Etobat Sarah. Today's stuff is sponsored by Alana Friedman in memory of her dear cousin, Devorah Itabat Harab Azriel Ze'ev on her yurt site. Devorah was a brilliant woman with a strong sense of justice and integrity who loved to learn and would have been my biggest tough cheerleader. She is loved and missed. May she be a Melitzat Yosher for her family and women everywhere dedicated to Torah learning. Okay, with that, we're going to get started. So the first thing to note is that we ended with this question where Rabbi Hanina said this halacha about the Torah, about the order. If you do something out of order... Do the Torah out of order, lo asava lo klum, and you have to start from the beginning. And then we said, but wait, doesn't that, maybe that doesn't work with Rabbi Yehuda. And then we said, well, it could work with Rabbi Yehuda. And then the Gemara said, but the Mishnah doesn't sound that way, because the Mishnah didn't say, it said when you messed up the timing, it didn't say, go back and redo the Torah. It just said, go back and redo the, the, um, the sprinkling of the blood. So, right, it said, ad shalo gamar matanot shebifnim, right, if you didn't finish the matanot bifnim and the blood spills. Remember, you have to start again. But where do you start? From the beginning of the sprinklings of the blood. It doesn't say, which means you have to go slaughter another animal. Jews, if you slaughter another animal, you're supposed to do the Torah after. It didn't say that in the Mishnah. To which the Gemara answers, Biktorah lo kamayim. It just wasn't dealing with the Torah. You can look at the sheet for today. I put up at the top of the sheet a chart about what the right order is, what happens in Mishpach Adam, and what the Mishnah says about it, and where, what parts of the Mishnah is missing. We're going to do the same thing now with Ula. Amar Ula. Seir, again, Ula is going to say a halacha, and then we're going to try to work it in with the, with the Mishnah. Seir shashachato kodem matan damo shopal. You mess up the order. Okay? If, right? The other one wasn't you messed up the order. The other was you spilled the blood, and then you had to redo the order. But it's a similar kind of case. If you slaughtered the seir before you put the blood of the bull on the altar, remember what, um, sprinkle it in the Kodesh Kodeshim. Remember what's supposed to happen. You slaughter the bull. You take the bull, you sprinkle its blood, right? You do the vidoy. We're not going to talk about the vidoy. You do the ktoret, which was what we just discussed yesterday. Right? You take the handful of the incense, you burn it inside. Then you come back out, you take the blood of the, pu- of the bull, and then you bring it inside and start sprinkling it. Then you go back out and you start with the slaughtering of the goat. The goat's not slaughtered yet at this point. Then you bring the blood of the goat inside and sprinkle it inside. So it says here, Ula says, if you slaughter the goat before you did the blood inside, you're supposed to do it after you do the blood of the bull. But if you slaughtered it beforehand, lo asava lo klum, no good. You have to start from the beginning. So Tanan, they say, but that doesn't seem to match our Mishnah. Because again, what does our Mishnah say? 
Kikdim dama seir ledama pal. Our Mishnah had said, if you do the blood of the goat before you do the blood of the bull, what do you do? Yachzor v'yazemi dama seir achar dama pal. You basically end up with three sets. You sprinkle the blood of the goat by accident first. So what do you have to do? You sprinkle the blood of the bull, and then you sprinkle the blood of the goat. This isn't a case where in Ishpach Adam and you have to re-slaughter an animal. But what's the problem? According to this, you're now going to end up in a situation where you slaughter the, the goat. Obviously, you slaughter the goat already because you have the blood of the goat. You slaughter the goat before the, the bull, with, you, before you sprinkle the blood of the bull. And we just, Ula just said that doesn't work. And here it just says, all you have to do is do the blood again of the goat. It doesn't say slaughter a new goat. So what do they answer, right? And then they say, if you're right, Ula, he should need to go back and slaughter a new goat because, again, he slaughtered the goat this time too early. So, what does Ula say? That Mishnah, our Mishnah, when it said, if you, if you do the blood of the, of the goat before the bull, you just redo the blood of the goat, that wasn't talking about the bloods inside the Kodesh Kodeshim. That was talking about the bloods inside the sanctuary. So let's set up the case. What did you do? You slaughtered the bull. You right, forget about the incense and all that and the, and the vidoys. I'm skipping all that. But you slaughter the bull. You bring the bull, blood of the bull inside. Then you sprinkle it. Then you sprinkle the goat's. Then, then you slaughter the goat. Then you sprinkle the goat's blood. That's all fine. Then you go outside to the sanctuary and accidentally, or maybe purposely, I don't know, but you sprinkle the blood of the goat. At this point, you have to do bull and then goat again. And then you wouldn't have to slaughter from the beginning because you've already done the right order in the first part. So he says the Mishnah must be talking about the, the matanot in the Hechal. I want to just talk about this word matanot. We talked about it before. There's two different types of things you do with the blood. One is you sprinkle it. There's actually more, but in, in Yom Kippur, you're either with this, specifically with the blood of the bull and the blood of the goat, you're sprinkling the blood either toward the kaporet, toward the parochet, right, toward the floor almost, right, and toward the top of the altar. You also do matanot, which is placing the blood, that's with the finger, where we go in an up-down motion or down-up motion, right, whether we go up or we go downwards. We saw both, right, different opinions, which one's up, which one's down, but that's called placing. That's from the word latet, matana. Matana is a gift, but it's also latet, to give, so or to place. So the word matanot and the word hazaot are two different things, but they're clearly used interchangeably here because here they're talking about matanot in the hechal, which could actually be the matanot on the altar, but it also could be the sprinkling. Okay, so we're going to see that the, the words are used somewhat interchangeably here. They're not necessarily always referring matanot to the placings on the four corners of the altar and the hazaot to the parochet and the kodesh kodeshim and all that. There's, they're used interchangeably, but they really do mean different things. And then we have zrikatam and shvichatam, right? If you talk about other terminology used, which remember we had a whole question once, does, I forget now, is it shvicha includes zrika or does zrika include shvicha, right? There was a whole thing, is one include the other or not? Which one includes which? So those are all different words used for blood in the Beit HaMikdash. Also, Rabbi Afas said that the mission was talking about in the Hechal and not in the Kodesh Kodeshim here when it gave this case that you just redo it because you really just redo it without re-slaughtering. If it had happened in Kodesh Kodeshim, you'd have to re-slaughter because it would be out of order. Now we're going to go to this next section that we saw that we have the Chem Behechal, the Chem Behmizbech, the Bissam Achloket in our Mishnah. I want to go back to the Mishnah briefly. The Mishnah said... Um, Right, you didn't finish doing the matanot and the kodesh kodeshim and the blood spills. You go back to the beginning. Each one is considered an independent unit. Today we're going to learn what each unit comes to atone for, why they're considered separate units. Each one is a separate unit. So if the blood spills in the middle of any unit, you go back only to the beginning of that unit. You don't have to go back all the way to the beginning and start from the Kodesh Kodeshim. But Rabbi Elazar, Rabbi Shimon say, You don't go back to the beginning. Today we're going to learn why they think that. You just continue from where you left off. So first the Gemara is going to talk about each of those sections. And to do that, they bring a bright. Tanu Rabbana. We're going to darsh in this pasuk at the end of the section of Yom Kippur. Pasuk Lami Gimel in chapter 16 of Vayikra. 
the, I'll read you the whole pasuk first. V'chiper et mikdash kodesh. Okay, it tones for the mikdash kodesh, which we're going to say is kodesh kodeshim. Vet or moed. Or moed is always the word for the sanctuary. Vet hamizbech. Here you see the three sections that we just discussed and the altar. Yechaper. Okay, so he atones for the mikdash kodesh, the or moed. Notice that word yechaper is unnecessary because it already said v'chiper, so you don't really need it to say again atone. And then the second part of the verse talks about who. So the first is where, and the second is who. But we're going to see that at least according to one interpretation, we're going to split this verse in half and say that the first half is talking about one thing, the second half is talking about something else. And notice the word yechaper comes up again. For the Kohanim and for the whole nation, it will atone. Okay, it sounds like it's talking about the same thing, but we'll see. We're going to dash in something different. And again, that word Yechaper is unnecessary. Every time it's unnecessary, we're going to learn something else from it. Tana Rabbana. So the Brighta says, Bechiper et Mikdash HaKodesh, Zeh Lefanai Velefnim. That's Kodesh Kodeshim. That's the Holy of Holies. O Moed, Zeh Echal. As I said, that's the sanctuary. Mizbeach, Kemash Ma'o. You don't need to explain that. That's obvious. That's the Mizbeach, the altar. V'chiper, what is that? Elu azarot. Okay, now the way Rashi understands this, and I'll already tell you, somebody else, Tosfot disagrees, doesn't exactly explain it this way and others, but we'll go with Rashi's interpretation. What this means is that each section, each time you do the sprinklings, each one, and the problem with Rashi is there are no sprinklings in the azara, so it's, maybe you'd say the shirayim, you could say, because the azara is outside the sanctuary. But it's one of the issues with Rashi. But each part atones for something else. So when you do the blood in the Kodesh Kodeshim, it atones for, now what does it atone for? Any kind of tuma that took place, like if somebody went into the Kodesh Kodeshim when they were tamay by accident. It, when you get to the next one, right? When you get to the Hechal, it's in case somebody went into the sanctuary and did something there tamay, or brought something tamay inside, or they were tamay. And when you talk about the Mizbeach, it's someone did a, something on the altar that they were Tameh or they put something on that was impure. So it's all relating, or someone came into the Azara with impurity. It's all relating to some sin that was related to impurity in the temple. Now you might think, what, this is what the Seir and the power are coming to atone for? Like, why is that so important? So first of all, it was, it was clearly very important. Okay, we're in Rosh Chodesh now. One of the things we bring on Rosh Chodesh is the Seir Yizim Lechatat. And the reason they bring a series in the Chata and you bring it on all the holidays is exactly for this reason, which makes sense. This is also a seer that they're bringing. It's to atone for any kind of mis, you know, mess up in the temple that had to do with impurity. As you know, it was a very central theme. It comes up all the time. That's very serious. If somebody brings something Tameh into the temple or it comes in when they're Tameh. So there's special korban just for that. And here we're going to see each sprinkling atones for a different section. Right? You thought this was all coming to atone for the sins of the people. No, not really. Okay, What's atoning for the sins of the people? Now we get to the second half of the verse. Second half of the verse, according to this interpretation, we're going to see there's a debate about this, but we won't see this till the, till the end of the sentence here. But this is Rabbi Yehuda. And Rabbi Yehuda is now talking about the Seir HaMeshtalach. Remember, this, the scapegoat. The scapegoat is the one that atones for all our sins. We're going to get to that much more in the next parrot. We're going to learn all about the scapegoat. So now they say, Kohanim, Kemashman. We know what Kohanim are. That's for the Kohanim. Amakahal Elu Yisrael. That's the, the Israelim. Who's left? Well, the Levites. So Yechaper, that extra word Yechaper, Elu Halevim. Hushvu Kulam the Kapara Achat. Now they say, it says, Kohanim, the Amakahal Yechaper. That means they're all together. Now, how are they all together? Didn't they have, wasn't the par for the Kohen, Kohanim, and the, and the goat? Right, the bull was for the Kohen and the goat was for the was for the people. Yes, that's true, and that's all when it comes to some sort of impurity in the temple. But when it comes to the rest of the sins, they're all together. They all get atonement for all other sins, everything that's not too modern mikdash for Kodashat. For everything that doesn't have to do with impurity in the temple, that's all the Sirah Mishalech, and everyone gets atonement for that together, including meaning the Sirah Mishalech is for the Kohanim. Okay? You might have thought, maybe it's just for everyone else. And they're all dealt with with the par. No, the par was all the other stuff, right? The Tumah and the temple. But the Sirah Mishalech is for everyone together. 
But Rabbi Shimon disagrees. Rabbi Shimon Omer, Kashem Shadama Sira Nasa Bifni Machaper al Yisrael, but to Mat Mikdash for Kodashav, Kachdama Parma Chaper al Akoni, but to Mat Mikdash for Kodashav. So first he says the same thing, really. He just says it in different words, which is, just like the blood of the Seir takes care of all the impurity in the temple in all the different areas, like for the people, for the Jew, for everyone who's not Kohanim, likewise the bull, in other words, you have the bull for the, for the Kohen, and the Seir, the goat for the people, they do the same thing, and that's why everything about them is parallel, because you do that, right, the sprinklings for the Kohen, Kohanim, and the sprinklings for the people. But here comes where he differs. He differs about the Seir Mishtalech. Now, what's the problem? Sir Mishalach is Mechaper, it atones. What's the problem? Usually the blood provides atonement. But there's no blood because you don't slaughter it. So, what about the Sir Mishalach atones? It must be the Vidoy, the confession. If you remember, the coin does three confessions. He does two on the bull, one for himself and his family, and one for all the Kohanim. So, they're now going to say, what provides atonement for the Jewish people from the Seir Mishalach? It's the Vidoy, the confession. So therefore, let's make that comparison to the Kohanim. Kach Vidoy shall parma chaper al Kohanim b'shar According to him, the par splits into two. There's the blood of the par, the bull. That atones for the Kohanim with any kind of sin they had that had to do with Tumana Mikdash v'kodashav. Which, by the way, now we can understand why the Kohanim were dealt with in a different way. Right? You might have thought, we actually didn't discuss this, but why is there a separate offering for Kohanim than there are for everybody else. If you say that those offerings are going for Tum Anamikdash V'Kodashav, then it makes perfect sense that they have their own offering because they're the ones who are mainly dealing with temple-related things. They might need their own sacrifice for it because the atonement that they need is different from the atonement that people who barely ever go into the temple need, right? It's much, it's just, I don't know if it's different, but quantitatively for sure it's different. I don't know if qualitatively it's different. It's something to think about. So now... We say here, so just like that, the vidoy is what atones. So the par splits into two. There's the blood and there's the confession. The confession part of the bull offering is for the kohanim and all their sins. So the seir mishdalech, according to Rabbi Shimon, doesn't have to do with the kohanim at all. They're excluded from the seir mishdalech because they have their own special korban and it's the vidoy of it which provides atonement. So the confession provides atonement, as does the sprinkling of the blood, each for different things. Okay, but the main point of which we brought this for was to show that each section, right, when you do it on the part in, inside the Kodesh Kodeshim, you're focusing on anything that happened inside the Kodesh Kodeshim. When you're in the sanctuary, anything that happened in the sanctuary. When you're by the altar, anything on the altar. Right? Each one comes for something else, and that's why we see the each are a different set. Tanu Rabbanan, another Brita, another Pasuk, which is actually very similar. We saw this Pasuk yesterday. It's Pasuk Kaf. In that same chapter, Vichila mi chaper takodesh. Remember, we said, in kiper kila, in kiper kila, in kila kiper, right? It was two ways of reading it. But basically, let's go back to what the simple reading. He finishes to atone for the kodesh. Ve'et o mo'ed, ve'et ha mizbech. Same exact separation here the kodesh, the o mo'ed, and the mizbech. So, Vichila mi chaper takodesh, zelefanad lifni. That's the kodesh kodeshim. O Mo'ed Zehechal, that's the sanctuary. Mizbeach, Kemashmao, that's the altar. Milamed, Shekulan, Kapara, Kapara, Bifne Atzman. It teaches you that each one is its own separate unit. And now, okay, this is a classic Midrash Halacha as opposed to Mishnah. Our Mishnah just said the Halacha, what you do if, right? If the blood spills in the middle, this is what you do. This starts, and it didn't connect it to the verse at all. This starts off with the verse and says, from this verse, we're going to get to the Halacha. And now they're going to go much more in depth into the Halacha that we saw in the Mishnah. And they're going to give a number of different examples. This is very simple because it's just review of what we saw in the Mishnah yesterday. Mikanam blue. So from here, the fact that they separate these three areas into three separate sections. When it talks about atonement, it means that each section atones for somewhat different. And therefore, If you were in the middle of Placing the blood, this is where I said they use the word interchangeably. It's really sprinkling the blood, not placing the blood. But if you're in the middle of sprinkling the blood inside the Kodesh Kodeshim, and the blood spills, you start that whole set from the beginning. Again, we're going to see Rabbi Lazar Rabbi Shimon disagree. Rabbi Lazar Rabbi Shimon This is what we saw in the mission, right? You start from where you left off. You were at number three. So you did three already, you continue from there and you do four, five, six, seven, right? And then you did one up and then you started your seven down, you spilled in the middle, you start from where you left off. 
גמר את המתנות שבפנים ונשפך הדם. If you finish that whole set, and then the blood spills in between there and going to the next set. יביא דם אחר ויתחיל בתחילה במתנות שבאחד. This everyone agrees with. You basically start where you're up to, because you don't have to go back, because you finish that set, because they're each independent units. נתן מקסם מתנות שבאחד ונשפך הדם. If you were in the middle, though, of the ones that you were spraying toward the פרוכת, יביא דם אחר ויתחיל בתחילה באחד. So you bring new blood and you start again. In that section only. רבי אלעזר ורבי שמעון אומרים, אינו מתחיל אלא ממקום שפסק. You start where you left off. גמר מתנות שבאחד ונשפך הדם. Again, you're in between set two and three. And the blood spills. So again, יביא דם אחר ויתחיל בתחילה במתנות המזבח. So you start from there, according to everybody. But, נתן מקצת מתנות שבמזבח, you start putting the דם on the altar, and then the blood spills, ונשפך הדם, יביא דם אחר ויתחיל בתחילה במתנות שבמזבח. Okay, this is really very easy, because it's the exact same concept. We're just applying it to each case. They're spelling it out. And then you start with that set. רבי לזר ורבי שמעון אומרים, ממקום שפסק ומתחיל. No, you stop, you continue from wherever you were at. Soon we're going to find out why they hold this way, okay? גמר מתנות שבמזבח ונשפך הדם. If you finished all those sprinklings and the placements, now what's left? You're supposed to pour the extra, the shirayim, at the base of the altar. So what if you finished ונשפך הדם? You didn't do the shirayim yet, the extra left, the remainder. דברי הכל לא מאחרי. Everybody agrees that it's fine. You don't have to start, you don't have to re-slaughter another animal in order to get blood for it. That's just the remainder. It's not critical. אמר רבי יוחנן, עכשיו רבי יוחנן is going to explain the root of their מחלוקת. ושניהם מקרא אחת דרשו. They both dash in the same verse. מדם חטאת הכיפורים אחת בשנה, we saw this before, right? חיפר אהרון על קרנותיו אחת בשנה. He does atonement on the קרנות מזבח, last time we dash in the beginning part of that פסוק, once a year. מדם חטאת הכיפורים אחת בשנה, okay? It says it again, once a year. So now they're going to say, what does it mean? From the dam of the sin offering of Yom Kippur once. So they're going to connect this sin offering and once. Each one is going to do it a different way. Rabbi Meir, who now we're going to understand was Tanakama, Chachamim. Rabbi Meir, Savar, Chatat Achat Amarti Lecha, Velo Shte Chataot. Meaning, you can only do, you can do one atonement, okay? Meaning, you can't do, Rashi says it, Velo Laasot Kapara Achat Mishte Behemot. You need to do one atonement. That means one unit from one animal. You can't have three sprinklings were done with one and four with another. No, that's not one katat. You need one animal to do the sprinklings. Now, we don't care if it's within a unit. That's okay. You can have one for this unit, one for that unit. But each unit has to be done with one animal. The way I like to say it is like this. It's a privilege to be able to sprinkle blood on the altar, right? We were commanded that we can do this, but it's a privilege. You can't just do extra. God said you're allowed to do this. You're allowed to do what God said. Seven, let's say, or right, one and seven, whatever it is. It's the amount that God said you're allowed to do. You can't start. So if you do three and then the blood spills and then you do start from the beginning again, you end up doing ten instead of seven. That's not what God said. There's one chitoy. Chitoy means to... Really, in Hebrew, it's like to disinfect. What it means is to purify, right? You're purifying things by atoning for impurity. So you're allowed to do that only once. You can't do that extra times. So therefore, that's how they understand chatat achad. That's why you continue from where you left off. So now, the issue becomes, right? They're basically saying, you're not allowed to do more than what God said, okay? Or what the Torah tells you. Tanya. We'll get back to this concept soon. Tanya Amar Rebbe, Li Chilek Rabbi Yaakov Belugin. Now we're moving to a different topic connected to this. We're going to talk about the mitzorah, the leper's process. So the leper has a bunch of things he needs to do. The ones we're going to focus on now are, he's supposed to take one of the kevet, the kvasim, sacrifice it, wave it together with a log, which is a measurement, liquid measurement, a volume, of oil, and he waves them together. Then he takes the oil, he sprinkles it toward the parochet, like in Yom Kippur, right? Not the Kodesh Kodeshim, but in the Hechal. Then he takes the oil, okay? These are on your sheet. You can look at it. He takes the extra oil, whatever's left. He starts to, he goes to the Mitzorah, who's, remember, outside Shar Nikanor. He stands by there with his right ear and his right finger and his right toe. And he puts the oil on the Mitzorah's, on the leper's right ear, right finger, right toe. 
Then he takes whatever's left and he rubs it on his head, on the head of the mitzvah. Okay, he basically like rubs whatever's left on his hands because he puts the oil in his hands. Whatever's left, he rubs on the head of the mitzvah. So now, according to Rebbe, Rabbi Yaakov distinguished. Chilek means he distinguished. He distinguished with Logan. We again have a set of sprinklings, a set of placements, right, on the ear, on the, on the finger and that, and on the head. So he says, when Rabbi Yaakov talked about the log, he distinguished, he, did, he said it wasn't like this halacha, okay? How so, right? So Rashi says, what does he mean by this? That in that case, we'd say, okay, if Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Shimon, I'm looking at Rashi, Rabbi Yaakov, Belogin, they're not identical. Because there's seven sprinklings and placements. Rashi says, in what way do they not disagree? They have to agree with one side or the other. Rabbi Shimon, don't think you pick up from where you left off. You start from the beginning. Okay, why do you have to start from the beginning? Because it has to be waved together with it. Okay, because it says log echad shemen log echad amarti lechaliyot kapara v'lo shnei lugin. It has to be from one. So therefore, you would the hadam would dikan the midrash chitoy echad amarti lechabat hachalik on the meimar hachi. There you can't say the same thing as there. Okay. Anyway, he says they don't disagree. However, there's a big problem with this. V'hatan v'lo really they don't disagree there. V'hatanya I'm going to show you bright to where they explicitly disagree. You did some of the sprinklings of the oil inside the Kodesh, inside the sanctuary. And the oil spills. You start from the beginning. There you have it. And they say exactly as they said by Yom Kippur. You start where you left off from. So what do you mean they don't disagree? It sounds like they, what do you mean they agree? They clearly disagree here. Let's keep going. Again, this is just, you know, the same idea over and over. Gamar He finished in the sanctuary, and then it spills. He starts the next set. That's fine. He brings new oil, starts the next set. He's in the middle of doing it. Let's say he puts it on the guy's ear, but he didn't get yet to his finger. You start that set from the beginning. Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Shimon again come in and say, Likewise, he finishes that set before he puts on the guy's head. Remember, he wipes it on the guy's head. At this point, just like in the previous, that's just the remainder that does, it's not critical. You don't have to bring new oil. So, basically, we're stuck with the problem. How did Rebbe say that Rabbi Yaakov didn't that distinguish between the cases, and they don't disagree here? They seem to clearly disagree. Ema lishana Rabbi Yaakov belugin. Ah, not lichilek. He distinguished. No, he repeated. In other words, he said it's the exact same machloka by Logan. It was a mistake. What we said, Rebbe said. Rebbe obviously said the opposite of what we thought he said. Amramar. Now we're going to learn about this matanot harosh e ma'akvot. The last part about rubbing the extra on the guy's head doesn't, it's not essential. My time. Ile, when we deftive, if you want to say, remember, that's going to reject it. If you're going to say, because it says, vaha no tar min hashemen, whatever's left, which means this is called remainder. Remainders are always not so significant. But that's not true. Ele me'ata no teret min ha'mincha hachinami dilo ma'akve. But it says, that whatever's left from the mincha, now this is a separate halacha. We talked about this a bunch of times recently, the kmitza. Remember, you take the dough for the mincha offering, you put your fingers inside, you take out a kmitza, a kometz, you put it in a bowl, you sanctify it, right? You have some frankincense, we're not going to talk about that part, and oil. Then you take it and you burn it on the altar. And the shirayim, whatever's left, goes to the kohanim to eat. Now they say there, there have to be shirayim. We actually saw this halacha. If there's no shirayim, you can't burn the kometz on the... You can't burn the kmitza on the altar. So it seems here, something that's noteret, says noteret minamincha, the same word, remainder, is essential because you can't burn the kometz if you have no remainder. There has to be that you took it out of something. If, let's say, all you have is a kmitza and there was no remainder, or the remainders got lost, right? You can't burn it when you don't have the remainder in front of you. So, there, it's not ma'akev. So what do they say? It is ma'akev, right? And here it's not. 
So it says, Shanehatam Dekhtiv Umiyeter Vehanotav. There's two terms that re- re- relate to it. One says Umiyeter from the remainder, and Vehanotav and the remainder. Because it says it twice, it shows it's Lakev. We've seen this many times. Anything repeated shows it's essential. That's why. There it's essential, here it's not. So we actually don't reject it. In the end, they say it is clearly the remainder and not so important because it says Vahanotav. Calls it the remainder. Amal Rabbi Yochanan. Another halacha of Rabbi Yochanan about the Asha Mitzorah. Since we're on the Asha Mitzorah, we're now going to diverge, uh, divert our attention to the Asha Mitzorah. This is the korban he brings with, uh, with a bunch of other korbanot, but this one. If you took the Asha Mitzorah, Shachato Shalol Lishma, again, we have a bit of a problem, Rashi, in the other commentaries. Rashi takes this literally. Some people say it's actually not talking about Shechita Shalol Lishma because that has nothing to do with our topic. But we'll explain according to Rashi how he connects them. because they're not. It's not the same. They're going to compare it to Nishpach Adam. Now, the blood spilling. To, it's, they're both mess-ups of a Korban. One is the blood spills before you put it on the altar, you know, and did what you're supposed to do. And one is that you slaughter it with the wrong intent. You take the animal, and instead of slaughtering it in, for a korban asham, you say, I'm slaughtering it for a korban ola or something else. Okay, you have the wrong intent when you're doing the korban. Now, if you recall, a chata and a pesach that you do shalol lishma are disqualified entirely. Any other sacrifice, and can't be brought on the altar at all. Any other sacrifice, like an asham, for example, if you do it shalol lishma, you can't, if you bring it, it's not going to count for what it's supposed to count for, this Asha Mitzorah. However, you're not, you're, you do sacrifice it on the altar. It's not disqualified. It's not pasul, as they say. You can, you're supposed to bring it on the altar anyway. You sacrifice it. You basically go through the motions. You do everything you're supposed to do with it. You bring the sachim along with it, the libations that go along with it. We're going to see that inside. You basically go along, but it doesn't count for the obligation. So Asha Mitzara Shashachato Shalo Lishma, Banu Lemachlok at Rabbi Meir Varela, Zara Rabbi Shimon. It's the same argument. That's what he says, Rabbi Yochanan. How so? Rabbi Meir da Amar Yavi Acher Viatchil Batchila, Hachanami Yavi Acher Viyashchot. According to Rabbi Meir, you start from the beginning, right? In this case, there is no midpoint to pick up from, right? Where there were sections. So you start from the beginning and you do it again. In other words, what? Now here we're going to focus on a different element of their Machloket, which we saw from the Drashat. According to Rabbi Meir, we don't care if you repeat something you already did. So fine, you slaughtered it already. What's the difference? You slaughter another one in its place, and you do that. But, so hachanami, you'll bring a new one in Yishchot. Ula Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Shimon, Shomrim, Yimakom Shabbasak, Mishamu Matchil. Meaning, remember, Chitoy Echa, Velo Shnei Chitoyim. You can't do it twice. So now we're stuck. You can't slaughter two korbanot for an asham, even though you messed it up. You actually can't do two for one korban. So therefore... We're going to say, Hacha ein lo takana. In other words, theoretically, he can't, since he can't bring two animals for the same sacrifice, just like he couldn't do a repeat of the sprinklings of the blood, he can't do a repeat of the shrita, so he's stuck. There's no way that he can fulfill his obligation for Asha Mitzorah. It's very interesting, right? This is a whole concept of, you know, in general, we always believe that there's always ways to fix things. You can always improve. You can always fix something. There's always some way to do it. This comes out and says, no, no, no. Sometimes you get into a situation where there's no resolution and you're stuck. So if you were to do it, Shalom Lishma, you're stuck. Okay. Now, Matzkef Rav Chista. Rav Chista says, what do you mean? What do you mean? Otoktiv. It says you bring it. Okay. So Otoktiv would sound like everyone should agree, even Rabbi Meir, that it's only one. And you can't possibly bring two behemoth for one korban Hashem. And even Rabbi Meir should agree with Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Shimon in this case. So they say, Kashi, it's in fact difficult. Rabbi Chista raised this question. Rabbi Yochanan, it's in fact difficult. However, the Gemara now goes and says, well, I'm, we're going to bring a bright at Tanya Kavate to Rabbi Yochanan. We're going to bring a bright that actually proves Rabbi Yochanan. You said you had a difficulty with it. I'm going to prove Rabbi Yochanan from a bright. Asham Mitzorah, Shashachato Shalom Lishmo. Here's our case. You slaughter this Asham Mitzorah, Shalom Lishmo, for the wrong intent. Oh, or let's say you didn't bring its blood for the behonot, and now you have no blood left, so you're going to need blood to put on the ear and the finger and the and the toe. Okay, remember we learned this. This is what I told you before. The one that he messed up or didn't finish doing the work with still goes on the altar. And you have to bring libations with it. And sarich asham acher And you need to bring another asham 
in order for the person to fulfill their obligation. So in other words, you go ahead with all the motions of this one. But in the end, you have to bring a new korban asham. Okay? So that seems to prove Rabbi Yochanan. That somebody holds you bring a new korban asham. It must be Rabbi Meir. Therefore, he does disagree with Rabbi Lassav Rabbi Shimon. But Rav Chista, who disagreed with Rabbi Yochanan, Amar Lecha, he could say, okay, he could read this in a different way. Might Tzarich, when it says, and this is a, a fascinating Mahalach, we're gonna, a fascinating way of thinking. When it says you need to bring another Asham Lachshiro, how do we understand it? You need to bring a new one, meaning bring a new one. He says, Tzarich ve'en takana. You need to bring a new one, meaning you don't fulfill your obligation with that first one. But sorry, there's nothing you can do. You can't possibly bring two korbanot asham for one, for one thing you did, for one leper. So therefore, you're stuck. Sarich means sarich, you need to, but no can do. To which the Gemara says, wait a minute. If sarich meant sarich ve'en lo takana, then tane tana sarich ve'en lo takana. The Brita should have said that explicitly so that we would know that that's what it meant. It shouldn't say you need to and people might misconstrue and think it means you need to but can't. So therefore, it seems very strange. So the Gemara says, eh, that doesn't bother me. I'll show you another case where it says sarich and it means ein lo takana. You can't do it. You need to, but you can't. Here's an interesting case. In v'hatnan, yes, it's, in fact, that could be the case. It says you need and it means you need, but you can't. It should be v'hatna, not v'hatanya. It says in a Mishnah, nazir memorat. If you have a bald nazir, okay? What if the nazir is bald? He has no hair. Now, one of the processes in the nazir is you're supposed to shave your head. Now, you can't shave your head if you're bald. You have no hair to shave. So, you need to put the razor over his head. Now, what do you mean? He doesn't have any hair. So we're going to understand need means, this is going to be a case where it says need means you need to, but you can't, and there's nothing you can do. In other words, you're stuck. This Nazir can't complete the process of his Nizirut because he doesn't, can't put the razor on his head. You don't need to do it. You just, in this case, he doesn't have hair, so you skip that part of the process. And here comes the explanation of Beit Shammai. Kesha'umrim Beit Shammai tzarich. That's the way Rabbi Avina understands this Mishnah. Need means need but can't be fixed. Okay? That's how he understands Beit Shammai. And then that would match what we said before about whether they disagree or not, right? That Sarich means Sarich. That bright to them would improve Rabbi Yochanan. This is the way Rav Chister read. But that Mishnah there, when Beit Shammai said Sarich, there's a debate about it. Pliga de Rabbi Pidat. Rabbi Pidat doesn't understand the Mishnah in that way. How does he understand it? What's the other option? You do the motions, even though it doesn't mean anything, right? So, he said that Beit Shammai and Rabbi Elazar, in some other case, have the same, right? This comes up a lot of times where we take different opinions in different places and we say they're really one and the same. So now we're going to see how he understands Beit Shammai from Rabbi Elazar's position in something else. Beit Shammai hadamaran. So we're going to explain again. I'm going to tell you this. From the beginning, what it means is, sarich means you need to pass a razor over his head, meaning even though it has no meaning, he doesn't have any hair, you still do the motions. You put the razor over his head, okay, he has no hair, what's the difference? How do we know this? Because he matched, he, what he said is, Beit Shammai Rebbe Lezar said the same thing. Now, now we're back to our case of the Mitzorah, the leper. Rabbi Lezar, Detanya, it says in a Brayta, Ein lo bohen yad u bohen regel, if you don't have, a bohen yad or a bohen regal. Actually, I think this is where it's supposed to be a Mishnah, and the other one was a Braita. I think it was my mistake. I'm not sure. Anyway, there's some confusion about which one's a Mishnah, which one's a Braita. You can look it up. I don't see it now in front of me. But the Tanya, as it says, Ein lo bohen yad or bohen regal. What if, okay, you're supposed to put the oil and the blood on the finger and the toe, the right finger, the right toe, and the right ear. What if he doesn't have? But if he doesn't have a bow and yad or a bow and rega, okay? Then, ain't lo tara olamit. You can't do the leper process. He can't, can't do it ever. That's not Rabbi Elazar. That's what we said before. It's like you need to and you can't and you're stuck. But Rabbi Elazar omel, and here's what we're looking for, no ten al mekomo yotze. You put it on the stump where he should have a finger. You put it where his finger should be, where his toe should be. You, you, again, you can't really put it on his finger because he doesn't have a finger, so you do what's second best, okay? 
Likewise, when it comes to, and this is where Beit Shammai says, you put the razor over his head even though he doesn't have any hair. So that's how we see that Rabbi Pidat disagrees with the Tzarich there. And then in that case, according to Rabbi Pidat, there is no proof for what Rav Chista said, that Tzarich meant, really, he has to bring a new Korban Hashem. And that would match the fact that Rabbi Meir does disagree with Rabbi Lazar and Rabbi Shimon also there. Rabbi Shimon Omer, Im nata, he, by the way, now we're just finishing that source. Rabbi Shimon gives a third option. Im shel yatsa. He doesn't have fingers on the right hand, so he puts another finger on the left hand. Okay, you can just do it on the left, right? Better to do it on the right, but if you don't have right, do it on the left. So that's another solution. Tanu okay. Rabbanan. Now we're going to talk about a different issue that has to do with the Mitzora, and then we'll come back with one small thing to finish up about our Mishnah. Going back to the Mishnah, our Mishnah, but here we're still in the Mitzora. It says that the Mitzora collects the blood. Now, they collect the blood. What do they do with the blood? So one thing they do is they put it on the altar, and another thing they do with the blood is put it on the ear and the finger and the, no- and the toe of the leper. So now they say, V'lakach midam ha'asham. Okay, this is when he comes and he takes the blood from the asham. V'natana kohen al tznuch ozen ha'amitahel. Now, it comes clear other, elsewhere that when he puts it on the ear, he puts it with his finger, just like we saw on the altar, when he puts it with his finger on the altar, the blood on the altar. So also here he uses his finger. So when it says, V'lakach v'natan, he takes and he puts. So they connect them and they say like this. Yehobikli, you might have thought, Lakach, how does he take the blood? He puts it in a vessel. Just like when he collects the blood, usually from the slaughter, you put it in a vessel, and then you carry that to the altar, and you put it on the altar. So likewise, the blood he collects for the purpose of putting it on the leper, you would think also has to be put into a kli, a utensil. Tambulomar vinatan. Manitina batzmosha kohen, aflikicha batzmosha kohen. Just like you place it. They, they, those two verbs come one right after the other. Just like it's placed with his finger, you accept it in his finger, meaning in his hand. He collects it in his hand. He actually has to do something strange. Collects the blood in his right hand, because Kabbalah is always in your right. But then he has to do the finger, dip the finger into the blood with his right hand. So what does he do? He puts the blood into his left hand and then dips his finger with his right into the left. If you talk about difficult ac- actions for a Kohen, it's funny this one's not mentioned. You'd think this would be a little difficult. Keep the blood in his hand, pour it into his other hand, and then start dipping his finger. Right, forget about all the blood that falls on the floor that we keep seeing in the backdrop here. Anyway, that's how he does it. Yachol aflim is bachkin. So wait, if you're collecting the blood for the, from this korban hasham in his hand, maybe also the blood that he collects for the altar. In other words, it's all collected at the same time from the slaughter. So you might have thought also that gets collected in his hand. Tamalomar ki kachatata hasham. No, but there's this pasuk that compares the hasham is like the sin offering. And just like matu chatatu unakli, all sin offerings, you put the blood in a utensil. Af asham taunkli. So nimtzet ataumel. From here we learn how did the asham mitzora work. Now getting into practicality. Shnei koanim kablim etamo. Echa biyan veecha bikli. Each we have two koanim that stand there when the slaughter happens. One collects it in a kli, one in his hand. And zeshikibel bikli balo etzam isbech. So the one with the vessel goes to the altar to sprinkle it there. Zeshikibel biya balo etzam mitzora. They kind of happen simultaneously. One goes one way, one goes the other. I don't know if they happen exactly at the same time, but basically they're not performed by the same person. Okay. Last thing for today, we were talking in the Mishnah about what happens if the blood spills, and then you need to start slaughtering a new animal and start from scratch. So now, or start from wherever you ended. At this point, you're going to end up. Let's say it was the par. You slaughtered the par. And now you spilled the blood, you have to slaughter a new part. Let's say you spill it again, you have to slaughter a third part. So now that was all we discussed in the beginning of class. Now you end up with a bunch of parim that were all used. You're supposed to burn, they're called the parim and israfim. They're supposed to be burnt in the Beit Hadesha. So the question is, which one? All of them? One of them? What do we do? So it's not a tam. Now this says it's in a Mishnah, it's actually a bright tam. It's not a Mishnah. It should say Tanu Rabbanan or something like that. There's two things that are true about the par. One is it has to be burnt in the Beit HaDeshen, which is outside the Machane Israel, which is the, the borders of Jerusalem. It's considered Halachic Jerusalem then. Um, and there's a whole debate about which side on the east, on the north. There's a whole debate about that, not to get into now. And it makes the Kohen who is dealing with it, he has to, he has, um, he has to purify his clothes. His clothes become Tamei. So all of the animals, everyone that's, whose blood was sprinkled, all these applied him. According to the rabbis, it's only the last one, and this we'll get into all discussion tomorrow, about when there's different parts of the process, right? What's the important part? 
starting it, finishing it, right? He claimed, if you didn't finish it, you wouldn't have received atonement. So therefore, it must be the one that you use last, that you finish the atonement with, that the last blood was sprinkled from that animal. That's the one you use and not all of them. Okay, I'm going to just raise a question for you to think about. Is there a connection between this machloket and the other machloket we saw today? To Rabbi Lazar, Rabbi Shimon, and the rabbis, and Rabbi Meir, really. Um, you can try to think. I haven't thought of a connection yet, but I wondered if they're connected with each other. Okay, so with that, I'll leave you. Have a Shabbat Shalom, a Chodesh Tov, and we'll meet back up together on Sunday. online already later on to put up uh, tomorrow's stuff.